Hey everyone, can everyone see me, everyone hear me? Give me a shout out if you're there. How are you all doing today, tonight? It's almost midnight in South Africa. It's, I guess, lunchtime or the afternoon in America. Uh, hope you're all doing good. Uh, today I'm going to take you through a few things. But first let me introduce myself. I'm Chris van der Walt, or van der Walt, if you're from the other side of the lake. Um, I play for a band called Volvadinia. We play brutal slam and brutal slam and death metal. But I also study jazz. I played in a lot of blues bands and uh, yeah, I've been playing bass for quite a while now and I've been recording for quite a while now as well. I've got a studio here in South Africa, I record a lot of local bands, uh, mix and produce them. And I also play Dingwall. Um, I've been very fortunate to own some of these instruments and I've never touched anything that has been built like a bass. Built by Sheldon Dingwall and his team. It's absolutely incredible. Thank you, Sheldon. So, today, today I'm going to take you through bass recording basics. It's just going to pretty much give you a couple of tips on what to prepare, what to look out for when you're recording, a couple of various methods, and yeah, maybe you'll learn something, maybe I can learn something from you. Um, if you have a couple of cool ideas or questions, Pop them in the comments. I can see it on Facebook. So, um, I mean, I'm pretty limited. I got my computer here and the phone here, but I can see Andrew Kim is there. Hey, Andrew, Regara, everyone. I'll give you some hard stuff in the end. I'm gonna, I should be playing some Valvedinia towards the end, but let's get cracking. All right. When you record your bass guitar, there's pretty much three ways nowadays that you can do it. Um, we all start off using an interface like this. It's usually a USB uh, that goes into your laptop or computer or whatever. It's got an input for cables, which could be XLR or jack to jack, and you've got your gain control, volume uh, master output, and headphone control as well. Now, most of your stuff you're going to end up plugging in this thing. You can go direct, you can use a DI box as well. The DI box is a little box like this which is quite nice because sometimes these things don't have a DV like a pad so when your signal is a bit hot if you've got an active bass or some some pedals that might be clipping some stuff uh, a DI is really nice to drop the signal or if you've got some 
grounding noise issues. Uh, DI boxes also really great to sort out all those problems. Um, then you can record straight into your interface like I said and you can also record into an amp. You could use a like a D112 or a Beta 52. Usually a kick drum mic is nice because it's got the low end response. But you could also just use like a trusty 57 as well. Um, you gotta use your ears, move it around on the cone. Keep it an inch or two at a kicking distance. Mankind has got to know. Um, yeah, so you kind of move it around. If it's in the center of the cone, you're gonna get a more brighter sound. And the more you go to the edge, the more it dulls out a bit. And there's a couple of things you gotta watch out for when recording an amp. So let's start with that. Usually when you record an amp, it's very seldom that you'll only record an amp. You'll use a DI, split your signal for two channels, so you'll have a clean DI signal and a clean amp signal. Uh, generally engineers would want this, and if you want to record with your mic at home, this is a good practice to follow. But, when you do this, there's something that you've got to look out for. Um, because your signal, the DI, is direct, so it goes straight in, it's a direct signal. If you're sending it to an amp, it's going to kind of move a little bit, move a little bit through the air, you know, when it leaves the speaker into the microphone. So there's a bit of distance travel, which means the waveform is a little bit late. And let me show this to you over here as an example. So what I did is I recorded a... DI track and the bass amp together, it's just the 57, and as you can see, they don't line up. You see that? It's a little late, alright? So, what we're going to do, uh, what we're going to do is, we, you can get like a sample delay, and the sample delay can move it back. In Pro Tools, you can kind of select how many samples it is with the marquee tool and, fi and adjust it like that. Or you could just go old school and literally just move the amp a little back and line them up, you know, so they kind of crossing points more or less the same. This is very rough. This is a very cowboy, but you'll hear a definite difference. So check this out. Um, I'm going to play it and then you'll hear. Nice fat. So I'm going to move it back where it was. And you can instantly, when it's not in phase, check it out now. It's like it's hollow. It loses that punch. And if we move it back, it's got instant fatness. Okay, give me a second. Let me fix that. So, when you do record, sometimes you'll get cr cracks and pops. Um, I've got stuff on the voice to keep it compressed and maybe a limiter on the output just so it doesn't clip your computers or your, your phones. But adjusting your buffer size is what you do. The higher the buffer size, the more your processing will allow. The lower the buffer size, the less processing you're allowing for the project. But um, higher buffer size increases your latency, while lower buffer size decreases your latency. So let's set it up to you. Anything under 10 milliseconds is really fine. It's like, you won't notice it. It'll sound great, it'll feel great, it'll be just fine. And I think the pops and crackles should be fine now. Okay, so back to the DI. Remember when you record with an amp and a DI to move them back into phase, as that will give you a fatter signal, you know? And if it's not in phase, well, you're causing phase cancellation which makes your bass sound like a guitar, I guess, in the end. You don't want that, you want it to sound like a bass, man, yeah! Okay, cool. So that's like the first way you can record. You can also just go straight into your DI, which will give you this sound. If I switch to the amp, you'll hear it's a bit rounder. Uh, 
and then we can just blend them to get a nice full fat sound. And the DI gives you that bit of attack. Cool. So that's recording with an amp and with a DI and how to phase align them so you get a nice fat signal. I'm gonna throw this out of the way. Done with that. All right, let's get back to some more stuff. So nowadays, these interfaces, I saw there was a question if I could recommend a brand of interface nowadays. Um, honestly, all of them are good. You can get a Focusrite, you can get a Personas. The Apollos are really nice. Um, I mean, the more you pay, the cooler stuff they can end up doing as well. The Apollos got the uh, uh, Unison preamps, which are pretty nice, but I mean, man, if you just get a, I'm using, on this computer, I'm actually using a Focusrite, and this is a Persona, so I have no uh, preference whatsoever. They all sound good, they're super quiet, um, and uh, that kind of gets me to my next point. When we record, we always got to think about what the level should be that we're recording at, right? Now, when back in them old days, you know, when I started with that sound, you know, uh, they, they taught us to, you gotta play loud. You know, get it in the red, try and push it, because that analog saturation created something nice. Digital is completely different. You do not want to hit the red. Um, they call the digital sweet spot is minus 12 dBs. So if you check around here, I mean, this is really small. Let me see if I can bring this up here a bit. Uh, it's also pretty small, but yeah. You can see the level here, that's minus 12 over there where the mouse pointer is right now. So if I play my bass, that's about the area. You can see here, it's around minus 12. That's, that's the sweet spot. That's where you want it. Most of your plugins are going to react better around that zone. Uh, you got a headroom for clipping when you do that. So if something comes up like a, you still got the headroom for that. And if you play soft, it's not. And I'm just going to mute the mic so you can hear how clean and how nice these preamps are. My mic is pretty noisy. This room is noisy. This is Africa, man. It's, if you listen closely, you'll hear, you'll hear the, I don't know what you call them, a kivit in the background. A little bird running around protecting its eggs against the adders in the night. So you can hear that's like super clean. There's no processing on that whatsoever. That is literally this passive bass into my sound device and it sounds great. You know, you, you, if you've got the right tools, then you'll never need to work too hard. And that gets me to my next point. Having, if, you, if you've got really cheap stuff, it's gonna give you a cheap sound. But if you have really expensive stuff, it's not going to give you any talent, but it's going to make you sound good. So first thing I can recommend is having new strings. When you know you're going into a recording session for your band, put on new strings. If it's a couple of demos and you're just writing, it's fine. You can get away with it. If you do have the luxury for new strings, man, they're always so nice. I got, I got new ones on here and they just spank, man. And... Uh, you gotta use good cables as well. If you think about it, cables, uh, they're the link between your instrument and wherever it's going, you know, whether it's into your interface, whether it's into an amp, your pedals, whatever it may be, you know? So good cables, I mean, good cables and good wirelesses. If you're using a wireless, it won't be in studio, but use good gear and you'll have less noise, less interference. Um, Sure, I think the average person doesn't hear the, uh, like an audible difference between cable brands and stuff like that. But something you will notice is the amount of, 
isolation different cables offer. So some cables are way more clean and, and can handle noise. Some cables are really bad. If you just tap your foot, it kind of picks up the noise. So it's also good to have a good cable. Um, if you're using pedals and stuff like that, try and stay away from the really cheap power supplies because they do uh, cr uh, create a buzz and a hum and it's super frustrating to have that in your recording, especially if you've got to stop or some quiet sections or stuff like that. Um, and then, obviously, at the end of the day, if you really want to sound good recording your bass, you got to have a dingwall, bro. Like, come on. Like, Look at that, if, if I plug in this bass, this is so, this is so nuts, like this is a P bass, right? So it's got that P sound. But you can take the tone down and... Let me put this mic off for better representation. And then, give me a second, yeah, I see. Stuff's giving me a hard time. Then, uh, you can also scoop the mids on this bass if you roll it forward. So it gives you versus versus and that's a passive bass. So, I mean, Dingwalls are amazing. I mean, the wood that they have, the craftsmanship, everything involved just makes it really easy. So I'm going to take a little break here and just check for some questions. Uh, okay. I've got the brand of interface. I see someone is asking what door do I use. It's Logic Pro. Um, it's pretty much GarageBand on steroids, but if you have a Mac, GarageBand comes free with it. There's a lot of free doors out there. Every door is the same. It's what you do, what you have in your head, you know, like the sound you're playing for that matters. None of this, this is all ones and zeros, bro. It's all the matrix. Don't worry about it. Like, uh, at the end of the day, if you hit that minus 12 sweet spot, I'm gonna emphasize this again, minus 12 sweet spot. Get that gain structure ready and you'll never have a hard time. People will be super impressed with the tracks you give. They won't be too hot. They won't be too cold. Um, they'll be just right. You want them Goldilocks tracks, bro. Okay. Um, so let me have another question. Yeah. Okay. So nickel or stainless steel strings and pros and cons for recording. Uh, they're both fantastic. It depends on, I guess, the genre and the setting and the style. I think nickel strings give me a more rounder sound, a more balanced kind of sound, where I feel the steel strings are very aggressive and they've got that top end snap with that bottom end punch. So it depends. I think like something like classic rock, nickel will be like aces, that's exactly what you want. And something for brutal slamming death metal, you want that steel. It just pops. And even for funk and stuff like that, you, I think you could use the steels. Uh, maybe for jazz, you'd go flat wounds. Um, so it depends really on the style and the genre. My personal preference, um, I love them steels, eh? Steel's good. This is nickel. I've just put a fresh pair of nickel on here, and I've got nickel on most of my bases because I do. We haven't been touring a lot, so I've been doing a lot of session stuff here and there, so I'm trying to have a sound that kind of translates over a lot of different genres. So it's been working. Nickel, nickel's a good all-rounder, you know? Uh, that's interesting. I see Jurg, it's Jurg Fesser. He says, on passive basses, the cables have a bigger impact than active basses. Cool, but uh, like I said, I'm going to learn some stuff from you guys today as well. I've never heard that. Uh, like I say, for me, it's it's the interference thing. And sometimes you get cables that look cool. You know, I got I got those tsunami cables and they, they got those nice tips and, and they feel good and they funky colors. And yeah, man, they're cool. So let's talk about something else. Sometimes you'll have a bass line that you're recording and it might be something soft. <laughs> 
and then something loud, right? So if you've got a really wide dynamic range and you want to control that, try and record in with a compressor. Like I use the Hyperluminal from Dark Glass. Um, it's pretty cool because it can kind of emulate the, or simulate the SSL G bus compressor and the 1176, and it's also got the uh, super symmetry. I, I always use a compressor. Um, playing live, we all have this fantasy of having dynamics. I'm in a death metal band, so I'm not playing jazz or slow blues. I'm out there trying to get my mix, my mix cutting. Every note should be like loud. Uh, if we have dynamic, it's the way we arrange the intensity of our notes. So we kind of approach dynamic in a different way. So therefore, I love a compression, compressor kind of just squeezing my stuff nicely into place. So let's, let's do it like a little test recording, all right? Let's, uh, so you can look at the minus 12 thing that I'm talking about. And then I'll show you like how we reamp it, uh, kind of plugins that we can use. Nowadays, there's a lot of things on the market. You can, like my favorite plugins are Neural DSP. They're fantastic. They, they get the slam sound down. They did the dark loss pedals as a series. They've also got Parallax, which is probably my favorite bass plugin at the moment. And uh, there's a couple of other companies who do Ampegs and and I guess oranges and all kinds of stuff. So go check them out um, It's really nice to have the variety of the all these amps and I'm sure they are purists to go Oh, bro, but it doesn't sound the same, but it doesn't feel the same. Listen It's 2020. We've come a really far a really long way since Guitar Pro 3 China or what what uh, Guitar Rig 3 Everything's like way better now and it, it sounds great and it feels great and in a mix, bro, you're not going to be able to tell the difference. So if you don't have money for a $2,000 amp, but you have money for a $150 plug-in, bro, bro, I've gigged with my laptop. I, I don't even gig with an amp. I, I use this X7 XLR out. It's got a cab sim, bro. You don't, yeah. I, Unless you want to be strong and fit. Look at me, I'm like a little lemming, bro. I, can, I shouldn't be carrying stuff, I'll break, you know? <laughs> okay, let's have a look here. Um, hey, Adam. Hey, Stefan, Stevie. What other compressors would I recommend? Um, uh, the MXR bass comp, it's the white one with the LEDs. It's, it's also quite a nice one. If you can find an old super symmetry from Dark Loss, they discontinued, so I mean, that's also always nice to have if you're a collector. I know the Cali 76, people dig that. Um, but if you're recording in a studio and you're fortunate enough for them to have an 1176 or something of the sort, try and use that. Um, it's great recording yourself, but you, you, could, you have to go try and go to studios with experienced engineers, because that's where you're going to learn the most by seeing it happen and hearing it in action and seeing all like all the little tricks that they've learned that aren't in the books or aren't on YouTube, you know? Not everyone's gonna reveal their secrets um, unless you hang out with them, then it's a bit different, you know? Um, let me see, uh, Thomas, do I use the double track high pass distorted and low pass clean? Well, that is a very good question. Um, I used to do it like that for ages. Um, it's nice to have the low end compressed and then a crossover where you have your top end saturated and then blend it all like that. But, but I'm gonna show you something today. It's called uh, Parallax by Neural DSP, but we'll get to that. It's pretty much, um, like a multi-band distortion thing, it's got a mids distortion, a highs distortion, and then a low compression. So it's like an all-in-one split, multi-split kind of thing. And since I've been using Parallax for my personal metal stuff, it, I haven't been using it that much. And when mixing a bass guitar, you gotta be careful on trying to get as much low end as you can, because you're gonna drown out the kick drum. Generally, when people mix your bass guitar, they're going to cut it out 
they're going to cut the low frequencies from about 70 to 80 hertz, um, everything below that out, you know, to make room for the kick drum. There's a space where the kick drum and the bass guitar kind of meet, like this, where, where they kind of roll off, you know, and that's, that's the sweet spot you got to listen for when you're blending and mixing and stuff. But I mean, the, the double track, low, low compression and high pass distortion is a great way to do it. You can, if you don't have the parallax plugin, try and do it, try, take one DI track, duplicate it. I'll, I'll, I'll do it today, I'll show you. Um, and then Manuel says, in a combustion NG AVZ, what pickup position is in your experience the one that stands more in a mix? Um, we can quickly talk about it. I'm going to pull out the combustion a bit later, but I really like the neck pickup. Um, I just like the way it sounds. It's got this throatiness to it. It's got this almost tube-like quality, you know, like or valves. I don't know if you're from the States, you're going to say tubes. If you're from Europe or UK, you're going to say valves, I think. But it's got this like glistening crystal-like quality, the, the neck pickup. So I like that. I'll play you some examples and I'll, I'll spin through them so you can listen as well. So let me quickly just record a little riff in here, show you a couple of tricks and uh, yeah, let's take it from there. So first things first, you've got your new strings on. Don't forget to tune your bass guitar. Let me just mute this. You guys don't want to hear this. Oh wait, it's a dingwall. They don't really go out of tune, do they? <laughs> okay. Fine. Close enough. All right. So, here we go. I'm going to record a little riff. I'll do the duplicate thing for you guys and just show you what, what we meant with that. And then I'll show you what Parallax does. So, here we go. Uh, let me put this metronome on. So, you can obviously record with a click track or without a click track. If you're recording without a click track, it's very difficult to put the band with uh, your tracks like together. If you're on a click track, you've got some kind of grid that syncs up with everyone afterwards. So if everyone's jamming together, it doesn't always have to have a click track. It gets a nice feel and elasticity. And if you're also just jamming some solo bass and you've got some cool effects and weird stuff, you don't need to use a click track, it's up to you, but if you're tracking for someone, sending tracks somewhere, use a click track. And if you can't use a click track, dance. It's all about feeling the pulse, I think. I don't know, I'm still trying, I guess. <laughs> Let me, I'm gonna mute the mic so you can also hear the recording properly. Uh, there we go. Okay, so as you can see, it's nice. It didn't clip anywhere. Even if I did that crazy stupid stuff at the end, still have some headroom for that. And it's not too soft. It's nice and in, in, in the sweet spot, you know, in the zone. Bouncing around minus 12 here. Okay. Cool, check this out. Let me show you this little trick. I actually just figured this out before class. So for all you logic nerds, if you right click on this, you can go custom icons, you know, where you select your bases or whatever. And then if you press plus, you can kind of import any image you want. And then you can drag this Dingwall logo in there. And then all your bass tracks have a Dingwall logo. Come on. That's pretty nifty. Um, also, if you guys have any questions afterwards, uh, if something wasn't clear, um, please send me a message. Uh, I love chatting to people. I love hanging out. I'm 
I'm a bit weird, but I'm normal. I'm, a, I'm I guess sometimes, but I can help you. I love helping people. It's kind of my thing. So for now, let's distort the space. All right. So I'm just gonna hang this up because we're done with this bad boy for now. Give me a second. Now, so now we've recorded this track, right? I'm going to duplicate it and just throw the track to the other side. Let's get a EQ in here first. And an EQ on the other one. So let's call this bass low and bass high. Okay, now that we're mixing, we can move the buffer size a bit higher. So, so it can have some better processing. Uh, Alright, so we're going to roll off a little bit of bass from about, let's call it 75. Let's listen to the bass. What is this bass? Let's listen to it. Oh, that sounds like it's underwater. Perfect. Okay, so let's just get this. So it's literally, literally, literally. Okay, I got it. Yeah! Okay, so it's literally just like a sub, you know, kind of feel that pulse. Now, the next one, we're going to cross over so we can kind of see this high pass is around 178. Let's, yeah. So this will start from about 178, right? So now it's going to kind of... See that? It's gonna it's gonna cross over. So now you got okay. But this is just the start of it. So now we want to compress that low end so it kind of stays consistent. Every note is fat. You know, you just want it. Walls to the wall. So I'm just going to take the Logic Compressor. A lot of these apps have their own thing. Um, just gonna do. You can learn about compressors on YouTube. Uh, there's a lot of cool tricks you can do. And there's a lot of ways you can also screw up your mix with compressors. So be careful. Let's go a bit back. structure as well this is just a sub nice and fat so when we switch on the compressor there should be no audible difference make sure your gain staging stays consistent when you bring in a new plugin a distortion plugin a compressor plugin or whatever so this this sounds like the same now we're going to start bringing in the highs but Ew, listen to that man 
Even just with these two tracks, I mean, listen how well they sit together. Uh, okay, let's get back to some questions quickly. I'll, I just see there's a. Do bass go brr? I'll make it go brr, Cameron. Uh, the the hyperluminal has no threshold. The compression but or knob is your threshold. You can set a lot of the stuff in the dark class suite as well. Attack and release, all that kind of stuff. I'm pretty sure you can fine tune quite a lot in there. So have a look. But the compression knob is the threshold. That's pretty much the amount of compression. Uh, you set your ratio and stuff in the dark loss suite. All right, so getting back to the highs, I'm just gonna throw a distortion on you. Let me get Saturn. Hail Saturn! <laughs> Sorry, I got a bad sense of humor, but I dig it. Okay. Let's settle to gonna put this EQ off the set and it uh, sounds like it's adding some low end. All right, so now if you put these together. kind of the gist of it blending two sounds so you're getting this top end saturation and the bottom end compression it's cool it's okay i don't personally like that top end drive tone or sound i mean if you go through it you can find it okay so that's the double track split it compress the low end distort the top end technique so what I do, what do you do, Chris? Let me show you. I got magic tricks. Ha, 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 ha. No, I don't have magic tricks. But I got parallax. It does sound like some kind of magic, right? So check this out. This is, oh, it's, it's like the holy grail, man. Just sounds so good. Uh, it's got nice oversampling stuff, which emulates higher sample rates. Uh, chows your processing if you do, do that. But let me play this to you. So, I'm gonna put everything off and introduce it as we go. So, this is what it sounds like. It's got a nice cab section as well. So this is the DI. Nice 57. Woohoo, old trusty. And then adding a ribbon mic. Ribbons are always nice and balanced. Then that's just the cab section, which is nice. Um, gives it a cool, like, kind of air response and a nice pumping feel. But now, let's add, introduce some low end compression. Whoa! So, and you can put your low pass level, so where it stops. So, now it's compressing right up to 400, but now, just 70. So, I'm gonna go somewhere in the middle that's pretty nice and then you've got more bands here that you can introduce right like uh, death metal bands funk bands no I'm kidding it's a mid distortion band and a high distortion band now I mean like okay let's just go default right so you check that's too loud if you listen to that, it's way louder on and off. Put it back down. That's it. I mean, that's the default setting. It sounds amazing. It does that 
dual track thing all in one plug. It's super aggressive, but I mean you can dial back. If it's got too much bite, you bring that down. I mean it's in my opinion, this is my this is this is the best bass plugin, in my opinion. Um it I guess it might not be as versatile, but I mean you've got the old cab section. If you don't want the drive, you turn it down, you can switch it off completely. You can just use single bands, you know, you could only use the high distortion or only use the low compression. It's up to you. Or a mixture of just high and low and leave the mids clean or whatever, you know? So in my opinion, this is the best way to get a sick bass sound. But you could always use amps and pedals and stuff like that. That's the great thing about recording a DI tone. So if you've got the DI tone, you can just send that back out with a reamp box. And that kind of sends it in here uh, with a, like a balance cable into your amplifier that you want to mic up and then you plug that mic back into your interface and you can do it with a million real amps if you've got the money uh, i know like frederick thordendal from a sugar has got the studio with all these amps wow that's beautiful it's super clean all the photos i saw he looks like a clean guy he plays some dirty metal <laughs> anyway okay so that's pretty much what I wanted to talk to you about today. The main things I want you guys to take away from this is it's nice to have a DI, but you don't need a DI if you're limited with budget. You get cool tube DIs and all kinds of transformer DIs that give you some kind of tones like the Neves and all kinds of stuff. But literally, if you just plug your bass into your interface, you're gonna win the race. Sorry, I had to finish that rhyme. <laughs> um, but yeah, you can you get a super clean signal. You can reamp it afterwards. You can use it with plugins. And I mean, that's all you need at the end of the day. And I mean, if you mic, remember to DI and mic and then phase align them. And remember, minus 12 is your sweet spot. Um, Okay, I'm gonna do one set of questions and then I'm gonna play some Volvadino. You guys wanna listen to some slam? I think I think you guys need some slam in your life. Sometimes sometimes everything is just too nice, you know, the birds are singing and and the sun is shining and then you know something like a virus comes along and um, yeah, that's what we kind of sound like. We, we change everything when we play. When, uh, we're not a background band and uh, when you're listening to the birds and looking at the sky when we start playing, you're gonna stop listening to the birds and you're gonna not look at the sunshine, my pal. You're gonna slam dance. All right, let's do the last couple of questions. I've deb been debating on getting Parallax. Dude, go get it. They've got a Black Friday sale now. You won't be sorry. If you want your money back guarantee, I'll buy your Parallax and uh, you can, I'll just have two Parallaxes. <laughs> um, I have used guitar plugins before, um, especially with delays and stuff like that. I really like that. So let's get, let's get the show on the right. I got to I gotta finish this off. Minus 12 tattooed on your forehead. That's my guy! Trust me, it's gonna make your life so much easier. It, you can you can go check it on YouTube if you don't believe. Don't believe me, like, go, say, go look for this stuff. Or just believe me and save yourself the time and effort and, you know, do it right. So, let's get this show on the road. Let's play some Balbobinia. Just look at this. Look at that. Just look at it.
I'm done now, I swear. I'm gonna stop shouting at you people. You have to adjust the bass sound. What's wrong with the bass sound? Please tell me. Uh, it's clipping at the moment. Yeah, I don't know, that sounds pretty good. Let's do... I like... Big bass and I cannot lie. All your other brothers can deny. Okay, I like that a bit higher as well. Yeah. Sick, let me play you some Balbobina. Thank you guys for tuning in. I'll say a quick goodbye after the song, but I hope you learned a thing or two or just got some of the basics down. Uh, like I said, if you have any questions, please, please feel free to drop me a message. I'll help you out. I love helping people out. I love making new friends and I love hanging out. So, yeah, let's do it. Till then. Slag. Yeah. I'm going to do anything with Lena give a shop mm. to feed my addiction. <laughs>
All right. So, one last thing. As you can see, I went on minus 12. I got some silly playing going on here as well where it's super loud, but it's not clipping because I left the headroom. So remember this, minus 12 on your forehead. Remember that every time if you're recording, minus 12. Use Dingwall guitars, like I can't stress enough. You can even hear the difference in the pickups. Front. Just got the mic in here so the last bit was a bit clicky because of that. Hey, that's almost like Toto. Good night guys. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much for joining me. And yeah, it's, well it's Friday night midnight here. I'm gonna go party. Two minutes to midnight.